balcony. We need some balcony questions. Why don't you repeat that question? Do I believe in UFOs or extraterrestrial visitors? I'm not authorized to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where shall I begin? Um, UFO. First, remember what the U stands for in UFO. Now, there's a fascinating frailty of the human mind that psychologists know all about, and it's called argument from ignorance. And this is how it goes. You ready? Somebody sees lights flashing in the sky. They've never seen it before. They don't understand what it is. They say, a UFO. The U stands for unidentified. So they say, I don't know what it is. It must be aliens from outer space visiting from another planet. <laughs> well, if you don't know what it is, that's where your conversation should stop. <laughs> you don't then say, it must be anything. Okay? That's what argument from ignorance is. It's common. I'm not blaming anybody. Psychologists know all about it. And it may relate to our burning need to have to know stuff because we're uncomfortable steeped in ignorance. You can't be a scientist if you're uncomfortable with ignorance, because we live at the boundary between what is known and unknown in the universe. Unlike what journalists write. You ever see journalists? Say, Any journalists here? <laughs> you go to journalists. <laughs> you go to journalists. All articles about science discoveries begin. Scientists now have to go back to the drawing board. As though we're sitting up in our office, you know, <laughs> masters of the universe. It's like, oops, somebody discovered something. No, we're always at the drawing board. If you're not at the drawing board, you're not making discoveries. You're something else. So, the public, it appears, seems to have this burning need to have to have an answer to what is unknown. And so you go from an abject statement of ignorance to an abject statement of certainty. So... That is operating within us. Let's start there. Second, we know, not only from research in psychology, but simple empirical evidence in the history of science, that the lowest form of evidence that exists in this world is eyewitness testimony. <laughs> Which is scary because that's some of the highest form of evidence in the court of law. But we know from second grade Where's my guy from second grade? Hey, get up to the microphone for a minute. Well, grab the microphone. Grab the microphone. In your classes, have you done the famous experiment where you play telephone and you line up all your kids in class and one person starts with a story and then you hear it and you repeat it to the next person and the next person? Have you done that in class yet? Yes. You've done that experiment? Because what, hap what happens by the time you get to the last person and they retell the story? What happens? It's like completely different. It's completely different. <laughs> completely different, okay? Because the conveyance of information was relying on eyewitness testimony, which in that case is ear witness testimony. And so, let's thank you. So, so we know that. So he knows it. He's in second grade. All right. So, actually, he should be in 12th grade as we've been now. <laughs> so, so now, so now. It wouldn't matter if you saw a flying saucer. In science, even if you have something less controversial than a flying saucer, if you come into my lab and you say, you gotta believe me, I saw it, and you're one of my fellow scientists, I say, I say go, go, back, go home. Go back until you have some other kind of evidence that's not just you saw it, okay? Because human perception system is rife with all ways of getting it wrong. Okay? But we don't like thinking of ourselves that way. We have high opinions of our human biology when, in fact, we should not. I'll give you an example of how it reveals itself. We've all bought and enjoyed books called, called um, 
Uh, optical illusions, right? Well, we all love optical illusions, but that's not what they should call the book. They should call them brain failures, okay? Because that's what it is. It is a complete failure of human perception, all right? All it takes is a few sketches that are cleverly done. Your brain can't figure it out, all right? So, we are poor data-taking devices. That's why we have such a thing as science, because we have machines that don't, don't care what side of the bed they woke up in the morning, don't care what they said to their spouse that day, doesn't care whether they had their morning caffeine. They'll get the data right, okay? So, maybe you did see visitors from another part of the galaxy. I need more than your eyewitness testimony. And in modern times, I need more than your photograph, which Photoshop probably has a UFO button today. <laughs> like, stick it in, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> on your computer. So, here's, the, here's, the, here's what you do. I'm not saying we haven't been visited. I'm saying the evidence thus far brought forth does not satisfy the standards of evidence that any scientist would require for any other claim that you're going to walk into the lab with. So here's what I recommend. Here's what I recommend. Next time you're abducted, because I'm ready for this. I'm ready. Okay? I get abducted. I'm ready. Okay? So you're there. You're like on the slab, because they always do like the sex experiments on you, on the flying saucer. So there you are, and they're poking at you. Here's what you do. You ready? You tell the alien, you'll be an alien for this, right? So you're poking me, all right? So then I say, I'm on this side of the equation. Okay, so I say, hey, look over there. And then he looks over there, you quickly like snatch something off the shelf, put it in a pocket, and then lay back. All right? <laughs> then, then you're done, you come back, and say, look what I got. Okay, I like stole the ashtray off the shelf of the flying saucer. And then you bring that to the lab. It's not about eyewitness testimony at that point, because you'll have something of alien manufacture. And anything you pull off of a flying saucer that crossed the galaxy is going to be interesting. Okay? <laughs> because even objects within our own culture. I got this a device here, okay? The iPhone. Ten years ago, they would have resurrected the witch-burning laws had you pulled this thing out, okay? <laughs> and that's in our own culture. Our own culture produced this over a ten-year span. So if, you, if there's some in, uh, technology that crossed the galaxy, that's going to be some serious stuff to look at in the lab. Then we can have the conversation. Until then, I can't... I'm sorry. Go ahead, keep trying to find them. I'm not going to stop you. But... Get ready for that time you are abducted, because I'm going to be looking for your evidence when that happens. And, and what my, I know, a last point on that is, there are people who have looked up, who look up all the time. Like, for example, the community of amateur astronomers in the world. I was an amateur astronomer. We look up, we come out of a building, we look up. Doesn't matter, we're looking up. UFO sightings are not higher among amateur astronomers than they are in the general public. In fact, they're lower. You say, well, why is that so? Well, because we know what the hell we're looking at. We know. <laughs> do you know? Do you? I don't. <laughs> because we study this stuff. Do you know there was a UFO sighting reported by a police officer because we think that because you have a badge or you're a pilot or you whatever, that your testimony is somehow better than that of an average person. It's all bad because we're human, okay? So there was a police officer who was tracking a UFO that was swaying back and forth in the sky, okay? Reported on the, on the hot, they're in, a, in one of the, what do you call the car? The squad car chasing a UFO, and the UFO's moving back and forth like this, okay? Later it turned out the cop car was chasing Venus, and he was driving on a curved road. <laughs> but was so distracted by Venus, he thought Venus was the one moving, and he wasn't even thinking that he was doing this. 